This is the internet channel for the study of Hegel. And here is your host, Robert Vein. This is the choosing. At the same time, the ego is also the transition from undifferentiated indeterminacy, that is the I that is doing the wanting, to the differentiation, determination and positing of a determinacy as a content and object. I want a cup of coffee. So there is the I that is doing the wanting, but the I is only doing the wanting if it has a concrete content and object. So when is this I wanting anything? When it's wanting something. When is this free will willing something? When it's willing this something. No, I'm not saying that correctly. When is this um, free will willing anything? Question mark. When it wills something. You are listening to Robert Vane's Hegel podcast. So when, it is, when is it there? Only when it has an object. Now further, this content may either be given by nature, like the cup of coffee or the apple, or engendered by the concept of spirit. Concept of spirit. He means to say, because that is what Hegel says, um, and he doesn't say it in his translation, there is a spiritual perception or um, imagination and let's say I, I want to put the apple on the um, cupboard because I want to protect it from, uh, from others who might find it and eat it. I want to keep it for myself for tomorrow. That, that's a very complicated act of volition or a series of acts of volition. Now that's a concept of the spirit. That's a spiritual idea. I want to keep this for myself and to... Um, have the apple out of the out of the way um, so that others can't find it, etc. So this positing of itself as something determinate, because that is what happens when I want the cup of coffee. This I that is doing the wanting is being determinate. It's becoming determinate. It's not just an I wanting anything. It's an I wanting this particular something. The will is now itself determinate. It's the cup of coffee willing free will. It's totally engrossed into this object. And when you want something, you're not aware of a difference between the act of wanting and the thing that you want. It's the same way with perception. You're not aware of the fact that you're looking at a tree uh, and at the same time aware of the fact that you are looking at something. Looking at a tree is this one act in which you as a subject that can look at something and the tree that is something that can be looked at are one uh, are both combined into one um, activity in the same with the free will i want this cup of coffee that means my free will is determined by it i'm not usually aware of the difference between the act of wanting it and the thing that i want when do i become aware of that when i want it and i can't get it I become aware of the fact that I want a cup of coffee when it's not there. When the coffee is already gone, or I can't get hot water, or there's no cup to be found. Or in my case, there is no sugar in the house, because then I don't like it. Um, so you see what I mean? Um, that's, the, that's the moment that you get this idea that there is a difference between the act of wanting it and um, the, thing, uh, the thing itself. This content may either be given by nature, as the apple is, or engendered by the concept, by a concept of the mind. Let me just take a look at paragraph 6 to see exactly what Hegel was saying in his German, um, to see how this translation... You are listening to goes. Robert Vane's Hegel podcast. Dieser Inhalt sei nun weiter als durch die Natur gegeben oder aus den Begriffen des Geistes erzeugt. So engendered by the concept of the mind. Um, it doesn't mean that the concept of spirit is the basis of a content of the will. He is saying that 
the, con the uh, object of the will is something that is only thought of. Uh, it's a, let's say, a future situation that you want to achieve. It's the apple on the cupboard. It's not there yet, but you want it to be there. And that is something that is not perceived um, with your eyes. It's not uh, felt with your body. It's imagined by your spirit. So that's the idea of engendered by the concept of mind. When you read it, read it like this, engendered by the concept of mind, it looks like the concept of mind does something here. No, it doesn't. Um, but the concept is given as something that I dreamt up, that I thought of. Yeah, I, I believe that is clear. Through this positing of itself as something determinate, the ego steps in principle into determinate existence. I have a quarrel with this um, idea of determinate existence. Um, it's a nice way of, of trying to do it. Um, determinate existence is a translation of Dasein, simply being there. And existence is a category of the second part of the logic, the logic of uh, essence. So I don't like it that he speaks about determinate existence in his translation. That, to me, immediately refers to the second part of the logic. And Dasein is a concept of the first part of the logic, um, the logic of immediacy. <coughs> Sorry. So through this positing of itself as something determinate, how does it do that? By wanting something uh, specifically. The ego steps in principle into determinate existence. So now my volitional ego, my free will is there. Can even be observed by others. Uh, it comes into uh, the realm of um, what really is there, the realm of reality. That's what happens. Hegel, therefore, makes it clear that before the free will wants something, it is there somehow, because otherwise it can't come into uh, existence, or rather in the state of being there. Um, but it, it's not real yet. Free will without willing something is real, isn't real yet. That it, it's what I said before uh, when we talked about paragraph 5. The free will is only itself there at the moment it wants something. And this is the absolute moment. This is the moment of resolution. Um, the finitude or particularization, particularization of the ego. Now the ego has a concrete contents. We, I, I, can, I know that I, listen to this, I know that I can want anything. Now, what contents has this I that I talk about? It's not my particular I, it's a completely general, universal I. When I say that I can want anything without wanting something, the I I'm talking about is abstract, empty, and universal. That's what that word means <coughs> when I say I want, I can want anything. But if I t tell you I want this cup of coffee, now you know that this I is embedded in my situation here with this cup of coffee at this particular moment in time, connected to these uh, natural impulses and desires, etc. So now um, the I becomes a particular I. It's the same word. The same word I use when I say I have free will, where the I means the universal I, and in fact means nothing in particular. Or when I say, I want this cup of coffee, and now the I means the real um, a particular I that has a being there, a Dasein. Any questions about this? I think this is pretty complicated. I try to make it as easy as possible. But this is a very important thing. Because this shows you that in the exercise of the free will, what is at stake is the objectivity of the ego, the reality of the ego. And Hegel says, when you think of, of the free will, there's always this 
universal abstract ego that wants nothing in particular, and then when the ego does want something, it itself, the ego itself, comes into existence, comes into reality, becomes concrete and and uh, and present. Yeah. You are listening to Robert Vane's Hegel podcast. Now, this is a Hegelian language. The will is the unity of both these moments. So now he's saying the will is actually what happens in between these two um, things as moments. I have the inclination when I talk about this to discuss it as movements from the start. That is, strictly speaking, not a, a very exact. Uh, Hegel um, describes the first and the second element as positions, and then the third element is the uh, the movement in between. Um, but this is it is important. I, I I believe that this is the case. The first position, the universal ego, the abstract ego, is the result of a movement. Of course, I'm always involved in wanting something. So how can I come to the conclusion that there is an ego that wants something by abstraction? I take an act of myself wanting something uh, as a starting point and I abstract from the object and I'm left with the pure self-awareness um, of the ego that can do wanting, but without its content, it's universal. And the second element is understanding that this universal abstract ego of volition, of wanting, is only concrete when it has a, when it does have an object and it really goes for the object and it is involved or rather absorbed in its object. But that's a movement too. But from that object I can do the same as I did in the first step and can abstract from that object and then return again to this universal ego that has no object. So it's a it's a movement. It's going toward the object that I want, and then my ego becomes concrete, and then abstract from that object back into myself, and then the ego becomes abstract again. Now he is saying what we call the will is not one of these moments, it's not the potential universal and abstract will of the ego inside myself without something that it wants. But neither is it the will that is totally engaged by and absorbed into the object that it wants, as if there is only something like wanting a cup of coffee totally different from wanting a book or wanting whatever. Both are untrue. It's not, it's not true that I already have free will without content, and it is not true that the only thing I have is free will with the content. Then I would have an infinite series of acts of volition, each with its own object, without any connection between the two, like Nietzsche suggested. For Nietzsche, this ego of volition is merely the sum, or let's say it's a... Um, not the sum. It's the um, it's the act of bundling, almost human language that he uses in the will to power. It's this act of bundling all these acts of the will together and attaching them to a subject, and then imagining that that subject is uh, individual reason. And of course, according to Nietzsche, it's not. It's, the body is the higher reason, and the body is, in a way, this bundling, this bundling power of uh, various acts. All acts would have a different ego, I know, yes, you're quite right. So the ego will be to totally broken up in this infinite series of egos, and each ego will be totally absorbed and identified with the particular object that it had. So, Hegel is saying, it can be neither of these separately, it has to be the unity of both. There must be something in the will that gives rise to the abstract universal first step and the abstract particular third, uh, second step. And of course, if you know anything about Hegel's logic, that's the way it goes. We first have the universal, then we have the particular, and then we have the individual. 
and the individual is actually the uh, the full expression of the whole. So if we have the unity of both these moments, we have this universalizing or abstracting element, withdrawing into myself, and we have the opposite movement of um, moving toward the, uh, the object and being absorbed by it. The will is the unity of both these moments. It is particularity reflected into itself and so brought back to universality, i.e. it is individuality. Remember that. This is something that you can use when, whenever you read Hegel. Universality, the abstract stage, in a way expressing the whole, but um, leaving one element outside of itself. And then the opposite, the particularity, taking the other side and in a way exaggerating that one. And then the, the harmony between the two, the, the ultimate basis of the former opposition, individuality. Uh, in, in German, um, uh, Allgemeinheit, that's the universality. And then Besonderheit, that's particularity. And then Einzelheit, that's the individuality. Don't think that individuality means personal individuality. It's not about your individu individual personality. Um, it's the <clears throat> more or less uh, unlucky translation of Einzelheit, which is an uh, expression for, um, uh, let's say, uniqueness and not so much of individual characteristics. It is the self-determination of the ego. Uh, in that, this, uh, everything is said. The self-determination of the ego. The ego determines itself, there you have the universal, as being determined by the object that you have the particular. And the fact that it does so in one movement, there you have the individuality. So the self-determination of the ego. If I know that I am letting my free will be determined by this object, I know at the same time that I want this apple, that I can stop wanting this apple, that I could have wanted the banana, etc. I'm aware of that at the same time. Now, awareness is not important here, but I'm, I'm giving that as an example. Hegel says these are logical elements that play a role whether you're aware of it or not. It's simply part of the act of volition in itself. But I can become aware of that. I just have to reflect upon it. I have to pay attention to it, and then I see how that works. I want a cup of coffee. What does that mean? That means that I determine myself as now wanting the cup of coffee, fully aware that I could have wanted something else, and I still can want something else, and I can stop wanting it. Because if I couldn't be aware of all of these things, I wouldn't be free. Suppose that you want the cup of coffee, and you're aware that you can't, uh, you can't want anything else but that if that would be possible. That, that would be awful. <laughs> it would mean that wanting the cup of coffee implies not being free to want it. But of course that nonsense, because to want something must mean to freely want something. It's uh, totally different from thirst. Thirst is a lack within yourself that projects itself to the outside, because we go in search of water or something else to quench our thirst. But thirst is, yeah, thirst is not I want, thirst is I need. And I need works very differently from I want. When I need something, I'm aware of a lack within myself, not a, not a capacity, not a faculty, not a faculty of thirst. <laughs> thirst is the expression to feel a lack, that is expression for feeling a lack. So it's totally bound up by the necessity of the object. There's no freedom in there. There's freedom at the moment that I can choose between a glass of water or a cup of coffee. And then I have a choice. Um, but I'm not free um, to decide not to quench my thirst anymore. I can postpone it, but ultimately I have to um, do something with my thirst. I have to solve the problem of my thirst. <coughs> Even though I remain free with regard to the selection of the means by which I quench my thirst. 
Okay, back to this. The self-determination of the ego. That is the individual element, the Einzel height uh, that we have here, which means that at one and the same time, the ego posits itself as its own negative, i.e., that is, as restricted and determinate and yet remains by itself, i.e. in its self-identity and universality. Simply this, I want a cup of coffee knowing that I could have wanted something else or can still want something else. In that experience, in that awareness, this whole structure of the free will is present. Both the abstract universality, I can withdraw into myself, I can choose something else, and the actual particularity, I'm determined to have this, my will is set upon the cup of coffee. And thirdly, the awareness that I am both. The ego determines itself insofar as it is the relating of negativity to itself. The relating of negativity, the negativity of uh, withdrawing into myself and yet um, negating that negation in order to become particular, um, to be determined by that object. So there is a negativity going on that is related to itself. It, it, uh, it, that's simply a negation in the sense that there is a difference between the freedom of the will and the object. One is not the other. That's negative. That's a contradiction. And we could leave it at that. Note that negativity is related to itself. It is, I am doing both the negating, this object is not the definition of my free will, it's just an object, and the negating of the negating. Still, I am determined to have this object. So, in my particularity, I am determined by the object. So, it's the negating of the negating that leads to this third Stage that we call the self-determination of the ego. Now, um, th this is the hardest part. This is the hardest part. I can I can promise you that. But because we, now we have the complete uh, element of free will. Um, let me see. I'm going to skip a little bit. But I wanted to show you this, uh, and then we. I think we need to to stop until really almost nine o'clock. Now this is the. Um, picture I made for the note on Facebook where I wrote about this wanting a cup of coffee. I want to ask you to um, to read that. To read that um, on the Facebook page uh, as preparation for next week because we then have to return to, I think, to paragraph 6 um, and then we'll go on with that next week. So, any questions about this section? Well, let me just show you the other uh, the other one. Oh yeah, this this is my my preferred one. That's uh, the illustration with the tsuzas in paragraph eleven. A human being posits himself as a totally indeterminate above his desires and is able to determine them and posit them as his own. That's the, the thing that you notice for the first time in your own uh, upbringing or when you have children. Um, that freedom appears as the ability to give some shape to your own needs. Here you have the kid who is hungry and who wants to eat this nice chocolate bowl or whatever it is. Um, and I think the easiest way for him to eat it will be with his hands. And there is a stage in our development where we love doing things like that with our hands. But at a certain point, I, I noticed that with my own um, eldest son, um, there comes the urge to shape that, to use a spoon, to have this utensil, this use of a utensil, of a spoon in this case, means that not only am I feeding myself, I'm, I'm satisfying my need, but I also am aware of the fact that I am the one actively doing that. So I'm enjoying not just my food, I'm at the same time enjoying myself. Yeah, 
Annika says that we're being taught that by our, our parents. Yeah, sure. But our parents are, um, by example, showing the kid that there is a much more enjoyable way of eating, and that is this kind of... Why is it so enjoyable? Because at the same time that we're satisfying our desires, we become aware of something else, and that is that we are above our desires. That is this, this part of the thing. Uh, yes, I think this is the this is, this is the moment that freedom appears in a very concrete fashion. No, 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 no. Freedom is not just satisfying your needs by eating with your hands. Freedom is actually um, constructing a specific way of satisfying your desires that is not completely driven by the desires. You are above and beyond your desires. That is the way freedom presents itself. If we act on our desires, we act instinctively. And there's no instinct that says, take a spoon. Yeah, that is what you have. But that's not the freedom way. The freedom way is not acting uh, on instinct. The freedom way is acting in such a way that the instinct gets its way, but in a positively um, human manner uh, with a certain choice. If this had been a Chinese kid, uh, he would have had to chop six in his hand. So it's not about um, anything that could be an instrument, an in utensil. I mean, the the satisfaction of using a utensil to satisfy a need is something very basic to human beings, to, to use utensils. Because a utensil always means I'm in control. I am determining what I'm doing. I, I, I have control of, uh, over my food. Whereas Grapping it with your your hands is much more um, closer to uh, let's say a, a, an instinctive act. Yes. It's just an instinctive act. My hand is not a utensil, so it doesn't express my um, my being above my desires. It's simply me desiring something. Then I reach out my hand. My hand is the immediate expression of that need or desire but the utensil is the together with my hand uh, using that um, is an expression of let's say my basic cultural being my spiritual being i'm above my desire i can use something in order to not just um, uh, fulfill my desire but to do so in a way um, through which i can also experience myself as being above my desire I mean, this goes for a lot of things. If you don't get this, maybe uh, some other example might suffice. Let's say that you're in a lot of pain. If you are in a lot of pain, you will shout out. If the pain is too much, uh, you can't control how you're shouting. But when the pain is separable from yourself, if you can have some kind of distance to the pain, you will say something like, ouch. Now, why do we say, ouch? Why do we not shout in any case when we have pain? It's a reflex, but it's language when we say, ouch. Um, there's a difference between shouting out in pain and shouting out that you are in pain. That's, that's an expression of language. And I think um, it's preferable to have a pain um, uh, that you that you uh, can uh, express as I am in pain, and when you're so absorbed in, into pain that you can only shout out um, without it being language. Okay, well we have to uh, we have to stop now. I hope this time the uh, recording uh, works. I'm going uh, for the end uh, um, all the way to the uh, to the end. Um, that is not the end. Where is the end? Oh, the end is here. So next time, next week, we will um, we will go uh, go on uh, where we left off. And um, well, hope to see you then. And if you have any questions in between, you can ask them. You just go to hegelcourses.wordpress.com. Uh, you can send me an email. You can leave a message on the Facebook page. There are many ways to reach me. And um, we can uh, 
discuss it further. Thank you all for uh, joining me this evening. And uh, okay, see you next week. You are listening to Robert Vane's Hegel Podcast.